Good evening and uh, thanks very much for joining us tonight. I hope things have been okay for you at work. I know it's been a complicated day for many of you. Um, tonight, I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by uh, Dr. Michael Devlin, who is the Head of Professional Standards and Liaison at the MDU. Mike was, prior to that, the Head of Advisory Services for the MDU, and he's got a wealth of experience in medical law and medical legal issues, um, and has written widely on uh, the subjects around the area. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about the patient safety framework, which is a new, um, or at least a change in, in how um, uh, patient safety issues are managed in NHS England, or will be managed in NHS England, and Mike's going to talk through that with us. Remember that um, an attendance certificate will be sent to you um, by email um, from GoToWebinar within 24 hours of the event, and there will be a recording of the webinar on the website uh, within the next five days. It's always helpful if you give us feedback, so please do that so we can uh, think of new topics to bring to you and uh, reflect on what you've told us. And um, if you have any questions, please put them in the questions box of um, GoToWebinar. Mike's going to be doing the talking. I'm going to be sitting in the background collating the questions um, for discussion after about uh, 45, 40, 45 minutes, and we'll try and talk through uh, as many of them as we can. If it's possible, keep your questions as short as you can, so we're able to address them and try and keep them on topic if that's possible. There's no way we can address all the questions we get. We often have upwards of um, 600, 700 people in, um, so we do always just take a selection of the question. It's not hard there. Okay, Mike, are you happy to start? And I'll just go quiet in the background. Sharon, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that uh, very kind, uh, warm welcome. Um, hopefully you can now see the uh, opening slide and um, you can see that today's talk is about patient safety, but we are not experts in patient safety, but I think what we do understand is how that fits into the medical legal world that we inhabit. So what I hope to do is take you through several areas. Um, as Gerard has hinted, we're going to start off with something new. Um, as you know, there's the new patient safety instant response framework. Now that's a bit of a mouthful and uh, they do refer to this themselves as PSERF. So um, that sounds a little bit odd, but since they use it, um, I'll be saying the same. I think the rest of it will be more familiar to you, but I hope that we'll just have a slight slant on it that will pique your interest, make you want to go away and read a little bit more. But it'll be covering things such as HSIB, which next month will become HSSIB. We'll be looking at human factors, I think a really fascinating part of the uh, patient safety um, uh, canon. <clears throat> we'll be looking at duty of candor. Um, some of you might be thinking, well, how does that fit into patient safety? I'll explain more when we get there. Talk about raising concerns, which um, let's face it, that's a really topical subject at the moment. And lastly, I'm going to touch on second victim, <clears throat> which I think is really important. As uh, you're all busy doctors, you've joined us out of hours um, on a Tuesday to listen to a talk on patient safety. And I think a lot of you will have experienced the stress and distress of being involved in a patient safety instance. So talking about the second victim, I think is an important area to touch on. So as I mentioned, we'll start off with the uh, patient safety incident response framework. So what is it? It essentially, replaces what was the serious instant framework that the NHS um, in England has been using for quite a long time. The serious instant framework um, had some people who believed it was great, it worked quite effectively, but there was a lot of people that felt um, some of the investigations were great, but it didn't seem to do much to really enhance knowledge uh, about what went wrong, why it went wrong, how you could prevent that in the future. So hence the move away to something that would emphasize learning. And first thing to say is it applies to secondary care organizations um, and that's by virtue of uh, the 
NHS standard contracts. So any NHS body that has one of those standard contracts will be um, subject to the uh, PSERF uh, approach. It is voluntary uh, in primary care organisations, um, as you will read. And although it was introduced um, in uh, August, September of uh, last year, um, all organisations in secondary care are meant to transition fully to the, the framework and the approaches that it uses uh, from basically uh, this month onwards. One thing or two things I'm quite keen to emphasise, um, and this is reflecting what NHS England say about it. One is they are keen to say this is not simply we're changing our cap badge, but we're the same organisation and we're giving you the same framework. So it's not simply a renamed serious incident framework. It is quite different in not only its approaches, but also in what underpins it in terms of general ethos. And it's not an investigation framework that basically prescribes what and how to investigate. Um, it introduces much more flexibility, and I'll just go on to explain a little bit more about that. This is the new uh, philosophy, and there's four components um, that I think are really worth emphasising. They begin by saying that it's this concept of a compassionate engagement and involvement by those affected by patient safety incidents. Now, very obviously, that will be patients and their relatives um, and those close to them. But also importantly, and the guidance makes this clear, it also applies to staff. And I know we're going to be talking about the second victim towards the end of the talk, but just to say that this forms very much one of the uh, central tenets um, of PSERF. The new thing, I think, is that it uh, now will be the application of a range of system-based approaches to learning from uh, patient safety incidents. So gone is the old-fashioned root cause analysis where you go through a very procedural stepwise process in doing interviews and um, having reports, but it's now looking at the whole system. So it's work has done within the system itself. The next point I think is really important, and this is what I quite like about it, it's considered and proportionate. Um, so you don't have to respond to every single incident, um, and you can indeed spend time looking at the less severe end of the scale, because you may well believe as an organisation that you've got more to learn from a particular set of circumstances. And lastly, um, there is this concept of supportive oversight. And what that means is the, the overarching organisations that trusts form part of um, have a duty to be uh, supportive in terms of the organisation itself. And the focus is on strengthening the response um, to the way that the systems function, i.e. how work is actually done, um, and also then to uh, leveraging as much improvement out of that as they possibly can. So those are the four building blocks, if you like, to the new uh, philosophy. And I emphasise again, it does seem to me genuinely to be a new approach. So what are the differences? Um, I thought this slide might be helpful just to try and highlight what these are. Um, gone are the complex thresholds. So as I've mentioned, there is this concept of flexibility, proportionality. So organisations can decide what they investigate and what they don't. It goes without saying that organisations will still probably want to investigate those incidents that are on the more severe end of the spectrum, but they're not obliged to, and uh, they can investigate others, as I've sort of mentioned. They're under an obligation, this is organisations, are under an obligation to develop a plan. Uh, but again, they're not tied to that. It's not a sense that they must follow the plan um, and do that to the destruction of everything else. So it's not a permanent rule, um, but it does help them put in place a set of uh, processes that everyone knows are there to help them. I've mentioned the serious point before. Um, Integrated care boards, they have a, ro a role, this support of oversight, um, as I've mentioned before, um, collaborate, coordinate, oversee and share. 
And this oversight mindset um, is important because what it encourages or what it's meant to encourage is improvement, um, but also in the context of psychological safety and curiosity. So that is something that I think encompasses all staff, uh, particularly all clinical staff, um, and not just uh, NHS managers. One of the um, key principles that comes out in the guidance is that uh, it is very well recognised that blame restricts insight. So the purpose of the new approach is to minimise blame, you would hope eradicates blame, um, and in that way they hope to learn as much as they possibly can from the investigations that are carried out. Just a couple of slides. When I first saw this, I just had absolutely no idea what it was talking about. But as I mentioned, the approach now is a systems approach uh, to working out what happens. Uh, the recommended approach is this uh, Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient uh, Safety, or CIPS. Um, and what it is, is essentially recognizing that when we work in a clinical setting, we are part of a large ecosystem, which includes the external environments. So you can see on the left-hand side, you can see the, um, the circle, the big circle that encompasses everything else, <clears throat> which is the external environment. And you can see tools and technology, tasks, the internal environment in the organization um, sit within that. But at the center of everything, of course, are people. So it's you, it's the doctors and other clinicians who are providing care to the uh, patients. What systems is interested in is how all these things link together. And the processes are essentially, as I've said it a few times before, it's work as done. So it's what actually happens when people go to work and carry out the sort of tasks that they need to. And the outcomes are the outcomes. So what happens at the end of that treatment pathway for the patient? Was it expected? Was it unexpected? Also, this uh, CIPS approach recognizes that that's a dynamic process and the arrows are meant to demonstrate in some way an element of dynamism. So it's not set in stone, it's not there is a single process in a particular um, system. It appreciates that the system itself can be constantly and infinitely variable, therefore the processes will also change. So although it's a really complex slide to look at, it's a complex diagram, I would certainly recommend googling it, having a quick look on the um, NHS England website um, under PSERF and you'll get all the supporting documents. I mentioned also that the whole approach of the systems uh, learning uh, is to look at the way that systems influence behavior, how we fit into the system, and therefore is there a systems approach to learning that will be better than the old-fashioned root cause and analysis. So what this slide does is it shows um, some of the approaches that uh, are recommended in the PSERF uh, guidance documents. Um, I'll just take you through uh, a few of these. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the patient safety incident itself and some of the mechanisms that can be used to do a deep dive into what happens. On the right-hand side of the uh, slide, there is a model that's recommended for sharing information, i.e. debriefing your teams uh, afterwards to share the learning and to better explain um, how the review was carried out. So looking at the left-hand side of the slides, um, starting at the 12 o'clock position, you can see there's something called an after-action review. Um, that is something actually that's not new. It, is, uh, it was developed in fact by the US Army um, and it's specifically beneficial where something fairly major goes wrong. Um, and it allows people to very quickly go and look at that and try and work out in as rapid time as possible what went wrong, therefore to put in place uh, measures to try and stop that from uh, happening. Um, on the uh, left-hand side of that um, diagram, so at the nine o'clock position, there's a multidisciplinary team review. 
Um, that will be very familiar to you. You are all very used to working within MDTs, both in primary and secondary care. But what this uh, means, uh, I've got a slightly different meaning uh, within the uh, lexicon um, of the PSERF uh, framework. Um, it is mainly used where there are a series of things that go wrong, uh, where it's felt that a multidisciplinary team approach will help the understanding. So by having specialists from various um, uh, clinical specialities, specialists from uh, nursing services, OT, whoever might be involved, um, you can then very quickly get to a good understanding of what happened. There's also something um, on the right hand side at three o'clock you can see called a swarm. Um, that uh, derives its name from the project management literature. So I think you may have heard of a concept such as scrums, where you get together some specialists um, to look at a particular problem and uh, come to a working solution. Swarm is a bit different, so that's when something goes wrong. You get as many people as possible who were involved in it together after the incident. Uh, you have a facilitated discussion, but the important thing is that everyone is encouraged to contribute. Um, the benefit of that approach is that things are still fresh in your mind. While things are still fresh in your mind, you're less likely to overlook something significant. And also because it involves every single member of the team, um, there is no hierarchy there. Um, some great insights um, can be derived from people who um, were maybe very junior members of the sub team um, who might normally get overlooked uh, in the formal uh, investigation frameworks. And patient safety incident investigation, um, that is more of a deep dive into a specific set of circumstances uh, where you are trying to um, look at something in particular detail because you think or you believe uh, that you can get some really good learning out of it. Um, so it is slightly more formalized in terms of there's a planning phase, uh, there's a synthesis phase, i.e. where you investigate and get information. Um, but the general principles are the same. They all follow the uh, CEPs uh, criteria. Uh, where you're encouraged to ask questions about work has done um, and uh, understand better why things uh, worked out the way that they did. So that gives you some idea of the new um, language that you might have to come to terms with. There are other things which as managers you'll come across um, as well, such as horizon scanning. I'm not really going to mention that in this talk other than just say it, it exists because I really just wanted to, to introduce you to the things that you're likely to come across in your own practice. Um, the debrief um, concept is um, this nice acronym called SHARE, which is um, setting the scene, hearing what um, is said, articulating what's found, summarising the response, and then trying to embed the new behaviours. Um, again, it's a nice, simple tool. I think everyone likes acronyms, so um, well worth having a read uh, of that guidance as well. When I mention guidance, um, some of it is fairly sort of detailed, so the overview of what PSERF is runs probably about 40 pages. But reassuringly, all these bits that I'm touching on on this slide probably only run to six or nine pages, so you can very easily dip into it and get a very quick feel for what it's talking about. So that is a very quick overview um, as to what is new uh, with PSERF. Um, as I said, there is a lot to take on board. Um, one of my roles here at the MDU is I'm responsible officer for the MDU, so I spend a lot of, peop uh, a lot of time um, talking to people about um, their CPD. One of the things I always emphasize is that it's really useful if you reflect on what you've learned. And part of that reflection might well be, actually, I need to go away and have a better look at some of this guidance. So it may well be if you, like me, um, started from a knowledge of zero, that you would do well by setting yourself some goals to say, I'm going to have a look at that uh, particular bit of guidance, uh, the sort of guidance on what actually happens, and then you can you know, 
perhaps give yourself an, an extra hour's CPD in your in your log in due course. So having covered PSERF, the next thing on the list was uh, the HSIB. And um, I think you're probably all very familiar with HSIB. Um, as you know, that they do independent safety investigations of NHS funded care. Um, you probably know that they had um, at their sort of concept planning stage, the desire to model themselves on what air accidents um, and rail accidents do in terms of their uh, particular investigations. So that is um, very much focused on a no blame or liability culture. And indeed, the very first chief investigator um, was um, an ex fast jet, uh, an ex fast jet pilot, um, who himself was also a a senior investigator in the air accident um, investigation branch, um, Keith Conradi, who's since retired, but he really got the organisation off to a cracking start. What HSIB do is they focus on a system level change. Um, and that includes very senior um, policy and regulatory change as well. Um, I mentioned that because, of course, it fits in now with the new approach of uh, PISA, which is also focusing on systems, because in changing systems, you have a chance of improving safety. The other thing that I think differentiates HSIB from, for example, local investigations within the NHS are the fact that they do use professional investigators. Um, some of these investigators come from other safety critical industries, such as I've mentioned, rail and aviation, but also nuclear industry, um, for example. So great wealth of expertise, but also fresh thinking and fresh approaches. Um, I should also mention, because um, I didn't in the previous section, that a lot of the processes and systems approaches that um, PSERF are using was informed by collaboration with HSIB, which is great because when there was consultation, for example, on a, a new and improved uh, patient safety system within the NHS, it was certainly the view of this organisation that they could do a lot worse than listen to the views of HSIB. So they've done that and we're very pleased that they've done that. You'll also probably know that HSIB have got two main investigation programmes at the moment. Um, the one which you've heard of the most, I'm sure, is the uh, national programme. That's what it was established to do. They don't do many investigations, 30 a year, but those they do do um, concentrate on what they can learn from the incidents themselves. Um, and the recommendations, um, although they're not binding, they are made nationally. Reports are published on the HSIB website. You're also maybe aware that when Jeremy Hunt was um, Secretary of State for Health, he also asked HSIB to take over the maternity investigations programme, which they did. So although arguably this um, fettered their independence because it was a direction from the Secretary of State, um, my view is that they've done a good job um, of the investigations that they've carried out. Um, they do make recommendations to the trust and you can see it actually takes up a lot of their time, a thousand investigations a year. So what's uh, changing? Well, the Health and Care Acts uh, introduced a new statutory independent body called the Health Services Safety Investigations Body. Um, and that is going to be fully operational from next month. And the maternity investigation function moves to a new body called the maternity and national, uh, sorry, maternity and neonatal safety investigations uh, units or MNSI, and that's going to be hosted by CQC. Just to mention that there were some wins um, for the medical profession, um, I have to say, in the uh, 2022 legislation. One of those was the um, inclusion of a so-called safe space. Um, what safe space means in this context is that the investigation materials that HSSIB gathers um, cannot be used for other purposes. So they hold that information to themselves um, and they don't distribute it to other organisations that ask for it, such as uh, the uh, police and the coroners. Now, 
they can be made to um, pass that information across, but only um, if a High Court judge agrees that that should happen. What that means, I think, in terms of you as busy doctors is that it gives you that extra degree of reassurance that you can speak openly and candidly to the HSSIB investigators. And that's certainly something as an organization, the MDU would always encourage you to do, uh, where you have the opportunity to contribute by giving what you know um, to investigators, do exactly that and um, cooperate and um, collaborate freely with them. There is also a new power to compel disclosure of information HSSIB have already said that they don't anticipate having to use that power often because most of the time it is voluntary uh, in any event. They do have powers of entry um, and again they don't anticipate having to use that um, very often or at all because in most cases um, healthcare organisations are wholly uh, and fully cooperative with them. The um, uh, Act uh, requires HSSIB to publish guidance um, on how it determines which instance to investigate. Um, I think that is also reassuring because not only will we then see um, how it's meant to be making those decisions, but we also have that reassurance that in fact they will be acting independently. They're not going to be told what to investigate by politicians. So that's good news. The previous uh, medical um, director of uh, HSIB was um, a physician, um, Kevin Stewart, um, hugely experienced, and he was supported by two uh, deputies, Sean Weaver and Leslie Kay. This comes from one of their papers um, in the Future Healthcare Journal, and it sets out the hierarchy of control. So right at the bottom, the least effective ways of improving safety to right at the top, the most effective. What we tend to see mainly are the engineering controls and administrative controls in terms of recommendations uh, to improve patient safety. The administrative controls, for example, will be to say, well, we need to improve training in a certain area. But as you can see, that is down towards the weaker end of the spectrum. Um, in the uh, Stuart and Weaver and Kay uh, model. That's not to say it doesn't work. So, for example, you might uh, be aware of the excellent work of uh, Tim Draycott in Southmead Hospital and the uh, maternity um, training that's carried out. Um, it uses the acronym PROMPT. And the uh, evidence there is that it's been hugely effective um, in improving um, the safe delivery of women by having um, really well thought out and um, frequent um, training uh, mechanisms. So um, that I think is uh, really sort of good news. Um, in terms of engineering controls, again, we um, know that there are various uh, ways that um, that um, is of sort of benefit um, and one of the really classic examples if those of you who are who are old enough will remember the problems with vincristine and intrathecal injection of vincristine but that was uh, something that was if you like engineered out by making it impossible um, to uh, provide an intravenous drug intrathecally um, before that there were just hosts of prosecutions of doctors so it showed that criminal prosecution was pretty useless at improving patient safety but um, cleverly thought out engineering solutions were, were really effective so going now um, on to the next part of the talk which is uh, human factors I've already mentioned uh, my own bias. I find this absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm always keen to know more. And um, I have to say, it's one of those areas that um, has been talked about for many years, the, the importance of ergonomics in how we work as doctors has long been recognized as something that's fundamentally important in how we then do our work. 
fundamentally important on the mistakes that we make and the propensity to make mistakes and in how we can avoid those mistakes. So um, this might be really, really obvious, but things such as tiredness, not being hungry or thirsty, being emotional or really stressed, which I appreciate is probably uh, um, very apposite at the current time, these are all things that will and do affect judgment. So not just in healthcare, but in other uh, safety critical organizations, this is well known. So for example, in aviation, um, you cannot fly an aircraft unless you are rested. Um, part of that rest uh, involves uh, making sure that you have a good meal, that you have plenty of fluids, you avoid things like alcohol, um, eight hours, bottle to throttle rules, and so on and so forth. Lots of industries recognize that you need to look after the staff. You need to recognize when they are under stress, when they might be going through life crises, and give them support, and also make a decision as to whether they can still be working in that environment whilst they're going through that stress. Also, this impacts on teams. Um, again, if you want to do a little bit of further CPD after hearing this talk, one of the best things you could do is go and listen to um, Martin Bromley. Uh, Martin is an exceptional speaker, um, both eloquent and intelligent, but his story is all the more powerful because it comes from experience. Uh, Martin lost his wife, Elaine, um, during a fairly straightforward ENT operation for sinus surgery. Um, after anaesthetic induction, um, the anaesthetist was unable to uh, maintain the airway. What followed were about 20 minutes where two senior anaesthetists and a senior consultant surgeon uh, were busy trying to work out why they were struggling to intubate um, Elaine. Um, yet at the same time, there were two um, nurses in theatre and two uh, ODAs. Um, and the nurses, for example, brought to the um, surgeon, say, here is a tracheostomy set. Um, do you think you might need to think about this? And essentially, what sort of happened was a complete breakdown in communication, in situational awareness. But when Martin talks about this, he doesn't talk about it um, as someone with a grudge. Um, what he did was channel that into trying to work out why these things happen. Um, and again, using his experience, because he's an airline pilot himself, using his experience in aviation, where they go through lots of simulations, where communication is absolutely vital. They're always talking to their co-pilots and double checking things that they're sort of doing. Um, they get around all these all these issues and they're much less likely to fall into the mindset um, that the surgeons and anaesthetists did um, in that particular case. Another name to look out for if you haven't already um, come across it and read it is uh, Matthew Syed, Black Box Thinking. Um, this has a little bit of overlap where he talks about rigid um, mindsets against uh, learning and flexible mindsets. Um, and again, we see uh, how easy it is for a rigid mindset to stop you making good decisions. I just thought I would um, touch on um, a few uh, examples of the types of things that we see as well. So we do see uh, files where there is impairments of judgment due to illness or drugs and alcohol. Uh, we've seen um, gross negligence manslaughter investigations, and you may be aware of the leading case uh, known as uh, Adameko, um, where this was an anaesthetist who uh, took over midway <coughs> in a procedure. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, and the uh, patient's um, ET tube had become disconnected. Um, this wasn't picked up for 15 minutes, and the first that Dr. Adameko um, knew of anything being wrong at all was when the Dynamap 
um, alarm was uh, sounding, showing that blood pressure was uh, dropping like a stone. And as you know from your physiology, that's a fairly late effect of uh, hypoxia. Um, he had failed to notice, for example, the chest wasn't moving, the patient was blue, um, and a whole host of other things that should have made him realize um, that there was something afoot. So, um, although that's an extreme example, um, it is, I think, one that we can all relate to, that it's very easy to um, assume that an alarm is faulty, for example, rather than thinking, actually, that is right. What is the protocol for dealing with this alarm going off? So, um, it then leads into situational, uh, situational awareness. Um, that used to be taught to undergraduates. I think it's uh, taught a bit less now. Um, the other thing, good example, is multitasking. Um, I can remember a case where um, there were two um, emergency uh, cesarean sections that were required. Um, just the one junior doctor involved in both went off to take um, bloods from both women uh, to group and save. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, samples were switched. Fortunately, it was a no harm error in that um, they were different blood groups and consequently it was picked up before um, blood was given in one of the cases. But it just shows you that if you have the right, the wrong set of circumstances, it will increase the predisposition of making error. And the last one in that list, which I'm sure you can all relate to, is defective interruptions on busy clinics, ward rounds, when you're halfway through doing a procedure, all kinds of things. It disrupts your, uh, your train of thought. It makes you much more likely to make an error. I said I was going to touch on duty of candor, which I will do briefly. Um, this has been in now for several years in terms of a statutory obligation, and you'll be aware that it's been something that has been required of you as an ethical principle for quite some time. Um, you'll read on the slides the things uh, that make it important, um, and just in the uh, top right uh, of the sort of four reasons, you will note that there is a patient safety um, component to this and that it does help to promote learning from patient safety incidents. I've mentioned that uh, there is both this ethical and statutory duty. I like to think of it as the statutory duty being a subset of the ethical duty. So the ethical duty applies to all clinical circumstances. The statutory duty will apply where there's moderate harm, death or worse. What could be worse than death? I'm not quite sure, but moderate harm also worse, probably a better way of saying it. The CQC is um, responsible for um, ensuring that the statutory duty of candour is followed. There is this general obligation to act in an open and transparent way. And what I've highlighted in red there is it's important to give an apology. To me, it's important to tell patients as quickly as possible what went wrong and what you know about it, but equally as important is getting that apology out there as early as you can and make it a real apology, make it sound as if it's coming from the heart, not surrounded by weasel words and um, conditional clauses as to why something went wrong. It is perfectly right and proper to say, I'm sorry for what, for what happened. <clears throat> what is probably less known about is that um, if there is allegation of breach of duty of candour, the GMC can and they do uh, look at these. <clears throat> but in three quarters of cases, as you'll see from that diagram, um, there is no need to take any further action. So what that suggests to me that even in the vast majority of cases, um, everything is happening as you would expect it to. In those cases that do result in a complaint to the GMC, again, the overwhelming majority of those um, don't raise any sort of concerns. Of the remaining, you can see about one in 10 um, get referred to an MPTS tribunal, so that's quite rare. The rest seem to be dealt with by way of undertakings, warnings or advice. The impact of the duty of candour, 
a lot of this is very positive. So um, <clears throat> this research paper in 2018 suggests that there was uh, better openness of culture, there was net reputational benefits, and also evidence that patients were more confident in the systems. Um, there wasn't any evidence that it resulted uh, in a reduction in complaints or litigation rates. That's quite sad, and I think people were hoping that might be the case, but it's no surprise to us that that would be the um, case because the complexity of what drives litigation often goes much beyond what can be covered um, by way of an explanation and an apology. Next, um, I'm just going to touch on raising concerns. Um, this is, as I've mentioned, um, quite sort of topical. Now, you'll be aware because it's been published, there is a new edition of uh, the GMC's core guidance, good medical practice, and that comes into effect at the end of January 2024. Now, these duties are essentially the same. So the new paragraph 75 of good medical practice um, says that doctors must act properly, so promptly if patient safety or dignity is or might be seriously compromised. You must act immediately if patient is not receiving basic, basic care. And um, there's a should in the next bullet point, say if there's problems with policy equipment or inadequate resources, you should raise this in line with workplace policy if you can't personally sort the matters out yourselves. And if you've got concerns about a colleague, seek advice and if necessary report in line with workplace policy. <clears throat> what I would say with all of those is that do contact the MDU as well. We're well used to giving advice in those circumstances. And the duty on managers is also essentially the same. So a new paragraph 76 says you must take active steps to create an environment in which people can talk about errors and concerns safely. There's also freedom to speak up guardian and local um, guardians. They are busy, um, as you can see, and you'll see the second half of that slide. Um, they say that 20% uh, of referrals, i.e. cases raised with them, um, involved an element of patient safety. Well, I mean, I would suggest that actually it's probably higher than that because where you're talking about inappropriate behaviours and attitudes and where you're talking about staff safety or well-being, these can be precursors to patient safety incidents in themselves. So um, I think they do a really important job. Uh, I think they're doing it on a shoestring, but um, hopefully uh, you will know who your um, local guardian is and you'll be able to contact them if you're unsure what to do about speaking up. Um, I would say this is a very common cause for uh, people to seek our advice. Um, I would say doing nothing is not an option, so there is a very clear, it's a must uh, in the lexicon of the GMC guidance, so therefore there's an obligation, an, an obligation to act. Um, what we would say though is that if you are raising concerns, please do it in the right way. So make sure you raise those concerns to the appropriate person. Stick to the facts, avoid opinion and uh, conjecture. Don't send an email to absolutely everyone about your concerns. Do act with other colleagues if you possibly can. Sort of many of you going to managers with concerns is more effective than a lone voice. And be really wary about um, a knee-jerk response. So if someone raises a concern about you, you might want to raise a concern about them as well. So please don't do that, but please be aware that other people can do it. So it can um, sometimes end up a little bit uh, nasty. Speak to the MDU, um, as I've said, and the last point I think is a really important one. If you are a consultant, um, I think it's really important to set a good example and to support junior colleagues uh, to raise concerns confidently. I'm just going to very quickly talk about the second victim because I realise we are sort of uh, getting towards the 45 minute point now. Um, <clears throat> this is a term that was coined by uh, Albert Yu um, over 20 years ago now. Um, Sue Scott, an American nurse and one of the leading authorities in the world about this, um, has given us a really good definition which you can uh, read there. And the prevalence is said to be really high, um, in some studies as high as 80%. So 
those doctors who are involved, particularly in serious uh, patient safety incidents, it can often really knock them for six. And in the next slide, you can see some of the stress responses that are seen. So acute phase responses of helplessness, worry, anger, short-term feelings of guilt and inadequacy, poor concentration, sleep disturbance, depression, even long-term effects of recurrent re-experiencing of the event, emotional numbing, hyper-arousal and avoidance. Um, and you'll see my comments at the back, at uh, the end of that um, uh, particular sort of chain, that these uh, reactions seem to be very similar to me as a non-expert, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but they do seem very similar to me to acute stress reactions, adjustment reactions, and there are some elements of uh, PTSD which are similar. So what I would say is this, this can be really quite significant in some people. But I would like to shine a light on a really good example on how this has been recognised and work has gone to uh, try and help colleagues. So this is um, something started by a uh, urologist in um, uh, Bournemouth and he put together a process where there's local support for surgeons after adverse events. Um, that has uh, certainly proven really so popular and um, I would also sort of say that it is something that um, seems to have gone from sort of strength to, to strength and has been looked at by other um, special, uh, specialties to see if they could do something similar. So finally, just a summary, um, culture of safety begins with people. That's why it's right at the centre of the new PISA framework. Um, do please contribute any time you possibly can to any patient safety uh, review. Um, do develop the skills you might need to take part in all those processes. Um, be curious um, about human factors and all the um, uh, guidance and what is written about um, patient safety. And also recognise that these are stressful um, and support colleagues as much as you possibly can. So um, with that, um, I will now... Um, stop and um, hand back to uh, Gerard to see whether we have some questions that we can take. Mike, thank you very much for that um, that gallop across a really big field of, of information for us to um, to look at. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned the second victim. Um, as a consultant surgeon, I remember uh, some things even now, ten years later, that um, I'm, I'm sure I'll never. Yes, I, I suspect that it relates to some of the things you're talking about there. But we do have some we do have some questions. I, I think I've I, I, I've pulled out some of the ones that I think we're going to be able to address. Um, the first one is, do you think that realistically we're getting closer to a, a no blame culture in the NHS? Uh, is that even a realistic goal? Because for many of our members and many of the doctors who are asking questions tonight. It doesn't feel like that. It's Gerard. It's such a good question, um, and you know, I certainly want to hear your views as well. I would like to think that we are getting there. My view is we're getting there much more slowly than we should. Um, we won't have a really good learning culture unless we have a no blame culture. The two things go um, hand in hand. Um, there are some organisations we know do this really well. Mersey Care is the one that's often quoted. Um, people can go onto their website and see the work that they've done, which is based um, on working and collaborating with a guy called Sydney, Sydney Decker, um, who um, has done a huge amount of work. Another airline pilot, but done a huge amount of work uh, um, on recognising the importance of no, of no blame. Gerard, what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that we have a we tend to get a little bit of a biased view because the cases that we will deal with on the ground with doctors in distress are often cases in which things have not been handled well. I think often we won't hear about the cases, or perhaps we're not hearing the cases that are that are handled better. That being said, it's no, there's no doubt that learning is being disseminated. It's been disseminated by multiple organisations, groups like Cores, etc. Are, are 
sharing learning across across various specialities. So I do think that we are trying to share learning. I'm not sure we're at a no blame culture. I'm sure I think there has to be a lot of organisational shift in organisational thinking for that to happen. I think that we're still attached to old ways of being. I'm hoping that as the old guard move out and the younger doctors come into the positions of responsibility, that things things may change. I'm hopeful at least. Um, I'm conscious that probably right now it doesn't feel like that for many doctors though. Yeah. Um, there was a there's there are quite a few questions and there's more coming in now just I've seen them now. Um, uh, what would the role of experts in the assessment of specialist areas of care? One of the audience members has commented on this specifically with regard to the HSIB, indicating that their experience of investigators was that that person didn't really think they understood the scope of the speciality and, and uh, what was relevant. Um, is, there a, is there an input for experts, particularly in more specialist areas of practice in PSERF as well, or is it or is it up to the organisation who does the investigation and the commenting? It is largely up to the investigation, and um, <clears throat> I have huge amounts of sympathy with the person who's asked the question. I mean, this is this is something that HSIB worked really hard to overcome, um, and it's why when they started life, they had these very senior clinicians um, as part of the senior management team. Um, but what they're trying to really instill um, into healthcare services is that it's not so much your expert knowledge of the case itself, um, but it's your knowledge of systems and able to analyse systems that will lead to a better understanding of what went wrong. So it's very different, for example, in a clin uh, clinical negligence claim when you are looking for causation and you're looking for blame. Um, with patient safety, you're not looking for that, but you're just trying to work out exactly what happened and what human factors might have been involved in making a poor decision or something like that. Um, is there an obligation um, on, on organisations uh, to ensure that everybody who is involved clinically is involved in, in the PSERF process? I'm thinking particularly about junior doctors who move on and who often hear about things uh, months and sometimes even years afterwards are made aware that there was a problem that was investigated and they weren't involved in any of it and had crucial information to impart. Is there anything in PSERF about that? I'm sorry, you may not have got that detail because I know there's a lot of documents. I've, I've been reading them myself, but um, is there anything you can do with that? Well, a lot of the new processes would really encourage that. Um, so, for example, Swarm um, is there to gather all those who are involved in the incident um, together. Um, the after the event um, analysis um, is also there to be able to work on that on that model. And indeed, the um, feedback and the debriefing process is very much meant to address this um, criticism, which I think is fair, uh, and we've heard it, I mean, I've been hearing this for over 20 years now, um, that people genuinely believe, they raise a concern that they never hear anything about it, goes off into a black hole, they have no idea. So I, I think this will be a big step forward because things should happen much more quickly, so it's much less likely that you will um, go off um, to a new job and there be nothing to be um, learnt from what happened with that particular patient safety incident. So the answer is say, specific, sorry, no specific, sorry, Mike, there's no specific tick box that says we've got all the people, but there is a process which should engage all the people on the ground at yeah. the time earlier and make sure their voices are, are heard. Exactly, yes. And, and, and I would encourage um, particularly junior doctors who are going to be more sort of mobile to maybe keep in touch with your previous consultants and maybe informally find out what's happened if you do happen to have left the sort of trust. Um, there's a question about human factors that one of the audience has asked, uh, saying that it's clearly an important part of things going wrong in, in complex systems um, uh, in healthcare. We have process in place to make sure that juniors get appropriate rest. Do we need to make sure that we're applying these same rigorous rules to senior doctors as well? Now, I think it probably does apply to some seniors, uh, but 
certainly I know for me as a consultant, I was on call from a Friday morning at eight until a Monday at at five pm for at points, and I might be up each of those nights in between operating. Do we need to start have a rethink about how we're how we're offering services? Jared, we definitely do. Um, what the audience might not know is that not only were you a consultant surgeon, but you're a consultant neurosurgeon. Um, and let's face it, you would have to be really well rested, have all your uh, faculties working um, to the various the best degree that they so sort of could in order to carry out such complex um, surgery under operating microscopes and so on and so forth. Um, it is something, as I say, other safety critical industries recognize. So, for example, even in the armed forces, if you are in the RAF and you're a pilot, um, you will go off and you will stay in a uh, hotel if you are on exercise because they recognize that in order to fly an aircraft, you must be rested. Um, so, it is really odd that um, in healthcare, there seems to be such a reluctance to recognize these really basic principles, these basic hygiene factors of sleep and rest and food and hydration. And it's quite shocking, but we need to do more to um, encourage um, the NHS and healthcare management to recognize and to deal with these very real issues. Um, one of the questions here, I think it's, it's, there's a couple that have come in that are possibly slightly off topic, but I think I, I'm going to touch on it anyway. So it's what a doctor is saying that a lot of the time when concerns are raised or complaints come in, it appears very personal. And they ask what kind of support is there to, to support? Uh, and then they put in brackets, not the legal team. Well, I, well I'll, I'll take that. Um, if I might at least start on Please, that. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think it's really important that doctors are a member for defence organisation and doctors realise that, that they are able to call us and speak to us uh, and share information with us um, confidentially and we can look at it and give them and give them some support. And not only that, we can, within the MDU, we've got our own peer support system that allows people to, we can direct people to uh, other people who've been through similar processes and, and offer some sort of support. In addition to that, we've got lots of other um, supportive um, uh, outlets available for doctors that we can direct them towards to help them um, uh, manage the stress and difficulties that goes along with being the, the feeling of being the centre of, of that or of an investigation. Mike, is there anything that you would say in addition? No, it was just really to reiterate the final bullet point of the summary slide, which was <clears throat> to recognise that colleagues need support. Um, a lot of the literature of the, the second victim recognises that actually the support by your peers and colleagues is absolutely vital. Um, and again, the military has shown that to be the sort of case uh, in helping to reduce the incidence of uh, um, problems um, after witnessing shocking events. It equally applies to um, healthcare. So please do recognise this in colleagues and please do try and support colleagues. But if it's you that's feeling stressed, never feel ashamed about seeking help and support. Um, I think we're we're probably there. There's one last question, which I don't want to end on a downer because I think I know the answer. But it's, will these changes really result in admissions of organisational failure, with all the implications for managerial careers and national politics? Well, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that question, uh, other than I suspect not, but I, I can't be certain about that. But ultimately, we're, we're uh, I'm not as worried about the organisations as I am about the patients and making sure that the patients are looked after. If an organisation um, is not is not responding well or an organisation is, is uh, coming out badly from it, that's beyond my period. I'm not going to be able to deal with that. But it's patients who are at the centre of everything that we do as doctors. And I think that any process that we can engage in that results in patients um, being treated in a more safe manner and having better outcomes is something that that I'm certainly all for. Um, yeah. Yes, I would agree with that. And uh, the only thing that I would add um, is that regardless of whether organisations change, um, our view very strongly is patient safety is just the right thing to sort of do for all the reasons that you've touched on. So please do keep supporting it in whatever way that you possibly can. Okay. 
Mike, I think that's the end of um, uh, the webinar for this evening. And can I thank you for that very comprehensive and, and um, educational uh, presentation. I hope that was of some use to people. Lots of reading to, to go and do. Um, and thank you all for your questions. And again, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but please do um, give us some feedback. Please feel free to come to our next webinars. We've got lots coming up over the next year. Um, I'm in the process of drawing up a programme for 2024 at the moment, so any ideas will be reviewed and considered and quite probably added to the list. So uh, please do uh, get in contact. And that, that's everything. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.